And now we're face to face with a Northwest poet in celebration. <laughs> A very good evening and welcome to this Thursday night's celebration face to face as we meet and talk to Northwestern authors and tonight with great pleasure we welcome Lem Cisse. Am I pronouncing that correct Lem? Yes. Cisse, yeah. I'm getting it yeah. right. Born 21 years ago in Billinge near Wigan, mm -hmm. brought up by white foster parents but then 12, 13 you went into a children's <laughs> home. Often 12 onwards, children's homes. It's a bit complicated, this. 12 oh. <laughs> onwards, children's homes. And then straight into Manchester at 19. 19. Yeah. yeah. Cleaning gutters. A clean it's a great business. It's a good idea for a business. <laughs> As bad gutter cleaning service. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was quite nifty, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you say you became a poet because someone nicked your ladders. It's true. It's true? Yeah, it's true, yeah. <laughs> the first real question here, are you a poet or are you a black poet? You know what I'm getting at. Yeah, I do. I, I am essentially, and first, a black poet. As I am a black person, I don't see myself as a person, I see myself as, as a black person. And I don't see within myself that you can isolate the two. Say, but let me, you're a person. Or just say, but let me, you're black. You know, I'm, I'm both of those things. Um, one doesn't cancel out the other. But I, I see in some of your poems, in some of your performance, <laughs> poems that could be written by someone who wasn't black. You do, I mean, th this mm. today will pass. Look at that chorus of when tomorrow leaves you, then you will cry, but tomorrow stays by you while today slips by. It's a poem that could be written by any That's excellent right. white poet. That's right, but the thing is that pe people think that all black poetry has got to do with is like radicalism or, or it's a reaction against racism. Do you know what I mean? And, and black poetry isn't about that. And black people aren't about that. We, we are a people and we cry and we laugh and we do everything that everybody else does, except for we have this added burn it, burden of, of racism um, co coming from colonial days, which plays a big part on our psyche and on what we are. But it, play, it plays a big part in your poetry. A, mm. a, a, a line, you say, we the singers of dreams, the echoers of screams. Mm. There's a lot of echo of screams in your work. Mm. Mm. But there's a lot of those same echoes within this society. You know, A lot of people say that racism isn't here anymore and that you know, well, it was my granddad's fault, it's not my fault. But that's not true, and it's not true of history. And history is, is as, as, you know, come down the bloodlines right to here, today, to racism within the studio, within Manchester, within England, etc., within the government. Um, so there are echoes of screams, definitely, and echoes of dreams as well. But do you feel a push? to write about the dreams, to actually say, I can use words now, I'm a poet. I mean, I, I perceive that in you a little bit, to mm. say I am not just a black poet. It's mm. almost as if it's not being a black poet, it's being just a black poet. Well, no, I, I am, yeah, exactly, I am a black poet, but black, black in the sense that black is, 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 is um, everything. Do you know what I'm saying? Me as my black, say, Africanness is everything. It's not... It can't, the media has marginalised what black is. Do you know what I mean? It says black is the riots in Brixton. You know what I mean? Black is this. Black is that. Black is rice and peas on a Sunday. But it's not. It's a whole, a whole life, a wholeness. And I, as a writer, have to show that to other people to redress the balance almost. Which means that basically I can write about anything. Do you know what I mean? But still, as as a black person, I mean, it is a political statement. Me saying that I am a black poet. But it, um, it's as personal as it is political, if you understand the definition. I hope that's not too All right. Definitions. Another definition before we get on with this I want to talk about, which again may confine you, may restrict you. Mm. It's been a performance poet. Because mm. you're great in performance. I've mm. seen you do it. And in a way, that's how you began. And you can talk about the oral tradition. But again, saying it's the oral tradition, you're a performing poet, is a way of marginalizing you and saying the stuff on the page where well, yeah, it's not yeah. quite as good. Yeah, then, yeah, is yeah, it? yeah, yeah. yeah that, I mean, that happens all the time. People say, um, I think you're a really good poet, Len, but um, I don't really think it'd look good on the page, would it? Do you know what I mean? And that's not true as well. I, feel, I see myself as an artist working to criticize and to make my work better on, a, on the page just as much 
in fact, more so than I see myself as um, working out my performance, because my performance is spontaneous. It's not, it's not like um, rehearsed. You know, I like I don't stand in front of the mirror and go, da da da, and I think that's right, that move. It's just me on stage there at that time. Um, so I see myself as a developing writer on the page, and and again, other people define it as you know performance poetry. Therefore, it wouldn't look good on the page, and that, that that's that's a nonsense. Really. I think it's nonsense as well, and yet there's a quality, there's often a simplicity about performance poetry, and there's a simplicity about some of the stuff you do. I mean, I'm trying to bring myself here as a literary critic to mm. this, and I notice that, for example, there seem to be very obvious pieces of language, the word sunset, the word Jew. You <laughs> use these images, but can I say, although they're obvious and almost childlike, they have a freshness when you use them. Yeah, I mean, in performance. No, on oh. the page they have a freshness. Yeah, well, that's for me. the beauty. Yeah, that's the beauty of writing. That is the beauty of writing. You're mixing. You're mixing down almost. Do you know what I mean? You, mixing what, down. Explain that. That's a right. musical reference. Well, yeah, it is, but it's very much like the musical word. Once you get, uh, say, an image like, say, um, uh, a very simple image like um, the flowers' petals grew. Do you know what I mean? Something oh. simple like that. Well, what you, as a writer, what you've got to do is trying to make that as original as it possibly could ever be, so that somebody could look at that and say, nobody else on this whole earth has written about that flower that way. Mm. And you do that by analysing your work and looking at it and rewriting and editing. Rewriting and editing is just like um, mixing down. Do you know what I mean? When, when you've got your track and you want to say, well, a little bit le less bass there and a little more tambourine there or whatever. Um, so you've got at home pieces of white paper with the crossings out. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I if people saw poets' bins, they wouldn't call them poets anymore, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they just say, nah, you know, that wasn't Ted Hughes, you know what I mean? Fine. <laughs> you, you read Ted Hughes? Who do you, um, you like, actually? Do you like... Well, I haven't read much work, which is like a major downfall in what I do. Maybe um, not. Maybe if you yeah, read a lot, it's yeah, easy yeah, to be it would pushing your way. Yeah, it would have made my style. But I think now that I've defined my own style, I should be able to read other poets and take from instead of instead of be influenced by in an um, overall sense. Um, I read Linton Quasi Johnson. I read um, I've read Marsha Prescott. So I've read some of Valerie Bloom's. Uh, Martin Glynn's a brilliant poet from Nottingham. Uh, Andrew Sulky. These are all a lot of them Caribbean writers who I've read, spoke to, and been influenced by. Um, I, I was going to ask you about that community. There is a community out there. Have you been helped by it and encouraged by it? I think yes, yeah. I mean, the, I mean the, I, I, doing what I do, if the black community didn't support me and didn't give me, give me that support, then I wouldn't have got to where I am now. Because what I, a lot of what I've learned has actually come from the black community. It's, a, it's actually... It's actually stimulated me and it's helped me with my own personal identity and my own political consciousness so definitely yeah watching you watching you in performance with an audience i don't know whether it was ho chi Minh or mao who talked about uh, the revolutionary swimming in his own sea and stuff of his own people mm. and that but i i felt that ease about you mm. but i feel that 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 ease has been given to me by other people, do you know what I mean, who've contributed to my consciousness. It's not a very individual thing, actually. You know, this, it's, it's the whole sort of like Martin Luther King thing, I suppose, can come into it where because you're a black person, because you're on stage, and because you're speaking on your own, you're a speaker for the people as well, which is like a dilemma which I get pulled into a lot. I don't really believe that I speak for the people because I've got too much to learn. And the media always likes to say, you know, oh, this is a black person. You know what I'm saying? Spokesman. And this is, Spokesman. yeah, that's right. This yeah. is, and I heard a really good thing in a conference the other day. This black worker said, um, a black workers' conference. He said, um, it's the take me to your chief mentality. <laughs> yes, fair enough. <laughs> which, which you I don't like, like that, man. You don't like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't like being the spokesperson because I think every individual. I mean, there's so many black mothers out there. This is for you, mothers, who have done so much for the black community and just being there. You know what I mean? And just being strong and just being. Just being there and keeping the family unit together, that they're just as much a hero or a spokeswoman as I am reading my poetry on stage, you know what I mean? All right, so we've talked about your debt there and your involvement with the black community, mm. and it's clear to see that, that they treat you a little bit as a spokesman because you're on stage, they're doing it for them, and you're black, and it shows that you can be a poet and happen and be black. That, 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 that's, that's a political statement in itself, as you said. Mm. What about the other half of your audience? 
the dear old white liberals. <laughs> hey, folks, this is, here you are at Granada. There must be lots of white liberals around here. I <laughs> accuse myself of that as well. It's, it's, it, um, if I start thinking, if I start trying to define how my audience sees me, it's like what you were saying before, in a sense. I go mad. Do you know what I mean? My head would go wild because, you know, there'd be people saying this and people saying that. So when it comes down to my black audience as well as my white liberal audience, even though I think I respect my black audience more, simply because I know that I can get a true and untainted criticism, whereas much of the white audience would criticise me for, for my political statement rather than my literary. Do you know what I mean? All right. Let's I, read as a poem. Because mm. what I feel in these programmes is we're talking about books and writing. That's right. And people are watching, and not everyone will have actually come across these books yet, although hopefully they're seeing the adverts in the shop windows. This is the book, folks. This is good. <laughs> Just read us one. I mean, if you go, which is the one of, there's quite a few where you have a go at white liberals, though, aren't Yeah, there is. Sh I'll, yeah. I'll read one where, on, where on. I think I'm, uh, I say having a go at white liberals only because they've had a go at me. And this is, people don't realise that when, when somebody smashes a window, they don't smash it just, or when I smash a window, I don't smash it just because it's, it's, it, I want, you know, just for no reason. There's always a reason behind things, and that's one of the things that I try and do in my poetry. This poem's called AIDS. Racism came to, from the West also. And it's about the way that people uh, try and say that AIDS came from Africa, whereas there's another philosophy that it actually came from, um, from American chemical yeah. um, laboratories. It's also about the way that the government has done a lot about AIDS, but done nothing about racism, because it wouldn't have enough hospitals <laughs> to fill. <laughs> to fill with the people who were hurt by racism. Go That's on. right. There's an AIDS scare. There's an AIDS scare. But let your ear fall to the ground. You'll find racisms everywhere. With the city life, cynic. The left-wing root, radic, the blue-eyed Tory, it's the same old story. A one in two disease, it is up on the increase. But I don't see no doctor to make it decease. I don't see no clinic for the Daily Mail cynic. I don't see no injection for this racist election. I don't see no nationwide press release. But the illness racism is Upon the increase, I don't see no medical analysis. I don't see no diagnosis. I don't see no patriotic recognition of this generation gene that holds a racist symptom. Dormant racism can blow at any time. <laughs> can be passed along <laughs> the family line. Sons and daughters, fathers, mothers, friends and uncles, and many, many others. This dilemma doesn't get coverage on the breakfast TV. It doesn't deserve the paranoia nor the reality. But this epidemic is a killer, you see, because the illness racism is hereditary. Passed like a child through a history. And the answer is still a mystery. I don't see no conference to define the cure. I don't see no pamphlet fall through me door. Yet racism, it stimulates to formulate a racist. And who suffers the side effects of illnesses such as this? Don't die of ignorance. Thanks, Len. Thanks. Thanks. No, that's, I think people know now what we're talking about. Yeah. And can I say that even though it works in the way it works there as a performance, mm -hmm. and don't you do it well, mm -hmm. it, gives, it gives a rhythm, and rhythm is, is an essential part of poetry. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, diagnosis, you didn't use the normal... Um, Di you, mm. well, however you said it, but it, it, I, I mean, I always try to understand Gerard Manley Hopkins and Sprung Rhythm when mm. I was a literary student, and I think I probably understand it far more sitting here... And actually listening, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So racism, we all tend to think, hey, God, it's the late 80s, you know, we're nice white people now, there isn't <laughs> that much of it around. I take it we're wrong, are we? Yeah, yeah. It's there all the time. Yeah, but people just don't consult the, pe the experts, you know what I mean, <laughs> which are those black people on the streets. They just go around with, like, with this thing in their heads that it's not there, do you know what I mean? As soon yeah. as you say, but wait a minute, they go, you know, suddenly on the defensive because they spent a lot of their lives actually confirming that it isn't there. You know what I mean? It's like a lot of people who aren't in contact with black people have, have like a real fear. Like in Atherton, where I used to live, they talk about Moss Side as if it's some kind of, you know what I mean, war zone. Like as if you're gonna, if you walk down Moss Side, you're gonna get killed. But it's not like that, you know.
Oh, it says bad on Hagfold Estate in Atherton. I'd just like to say that for you. <laughs> <people>. <laughs> Let's go one stage on from Moss Side to a war zone, mm. South Africa, mm. which informs a lot of the work you do. I mean, a, a fabulous poem in here about what it is, but buried, buried under the floorboards yeah, or whatever. Yeah, uh, African metaphor. African metaphor. A, a lot of the stuff that you do has a real edge to it. Mm. And you talk about booting out. In a performance I saw you do recently, you began to talk about booting mm. out, and a Christian in the back of the hall interrupted your performance and said, the answer is not violence. Mm. And you got a little bit involved there, you dealt pretty well with it. Mm. But where do you stand there? Because isn't that a difficult one? Well, it's not for me, because the way that the Queen got, I mean, I said this at the performance, but the way that the Queen got, got into this country is by war. There was a war, and, and then the Queen, the monarchy was allocated, etc., etc. And then a law was brought out saying, you, you know, war is bad. <laughs> sure. Which is like, there's a bit well, of a contradiction do. After in terms. After you come to power, you always get rid of yeah, whatever it was right. that got yeah, you yeah. there, so no one else can yeah, get it. Yeah, that's there. right. And anything that hasn't got to do with the political points of views of this country is called terrorism. So there's, there's something to be questioned there, yeah? And when you question it, you, you, you see that through history, war is an inevitable, and how it has been an inevitable part of any society's change. Uh, of all societies change, uh, dramatic change. So and, if someone and said your poetry in places calls for violence. Yeah, it does. It doesn't call for violence, but it documents violence in its, in, in its real sense and not in its tainted um, sense. But, but, but There's no on, propaganda. Don't, do, don't slither out of it. Does it call for violence? Are you prepared to say that? Let me give, let me give you a, an easier way of looking at it. Let's not talk about Winnie Mandela now, because yeah, it's very yeah. complicated. But yeah. let's talk about what was a real dividing point, the matches and necklaces speech three years ago, whatever yeah, it was, yeah, right? Yeah. And you could, and that speech, did you agree with her saying that or not, put people on either side? I where yeah. did you, what did you do? I, well, I don't know about the speech, because I didn't actually, I rem don't remember it, but I can still answer your question. Mm. I would, um, this isn't easy, folks. It's not, I don't, it's, um, yes, but, but when it comes down to the necklace, oh, I shouldn't be saying. Go on, what you feel. Uh, that uh, under certain circumstances, if um, death is inevitable, if the necklace has to be, I mean, I'm sure there's more humane ways than the necklace, actually, um, then, then it's got to be, yeah. But the terrorist would argue that he must scare them, and the necklace is scare, and by scaring them, and, that, and together with that violence, only then will mm. you get justice. Well, all I can say is that I would agree with the actual death, uh, the actual uh, inevitable death, but I wouldn't, I can't, because I'm not conscious enough to be able to say that a necklace within that situation is the right thing. It's <laughs> very unfair of me. I'm asking you here. No, I'm doing it too, aren't I? I'm asking you to be a political spokesman. Well, this Your is poetry. Yeah, exactly. Do it, let's this have a little bit of poetry. Your poetry contains things with a delicacy that as a political spokesman, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't expect. I, I'll just read um, at this only part of this, um, I don't want to read it all because it's quite a long poem, but this is African metaphor and this is about the way things change from speech to action. You can't sweep dust under the rug anymore. You can't keep hiding bodies under the boards of the floor. <laughs> you can't sanction the hearts of an African race. You can't hide a man from his very own face. You can never be a king if you will let yourself the crown. You cannot perceive the suffering if you've never been down. You're on the great white animal colonial ego trip, but soon you will be penned into your own township. Your tables of justice will be turned until they fall upon your knees, and our cries of injustice will drown your pathetic pleas. You can't remember the Sharpeville massacre. Do you remember the exploitation of Namibia? You can't remember Mangaliso Sobukwe. Do you remember the name? Azania. <laughs> you can't sweep dust under the rug anymore. Just, that's only part of the poem. It's only part of that poem. There's a lot more to it. But that's, I mean, to be honest, I was forcing you into mm. making political statements. Mm. Yeah, exactly. You do what that you was do. Part of you I mean, exactly. because of that, can I actually read yeah. something go that's on, go on. Sure, sure. totally got to do with... Sure. This is your program, not mine. Go on. Anything you want to do, man. I like this. I like this. The it. last time he was on television, <laughs> we gave him a very hard time. We gave him one and a half <laughs> minutes, and I rushed him through. And you were very nervous that time, I was, you? yeah. I was I'm sorry I put you through that. You know, it's right. Go on. This is called Was It... No, I'm not going to read that. Go on, go on, go on. Okay, this is called Was It Turn. It's about... It's a about 
me in a cafe. It's a very Roger McGoffish poem, this, right? And it will go down well at the South Bank as well. Was it a cafe window, or a picture of a cafe window on a cafe wall, or was it a picture of a cafe wall and a cafe window on a cafe wall? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's a nice poem. I like that one. I'm glad you read that one. Because it's short, and it gives yes. us a little bit of time to yeah, talk yeah. towards the end in this last few minutes. Is the play that just happened in Manchester, mm -hmm. which you wrote called Staking a Claim, uh -huh. using the Contact Youth Theatre. I think the first thing we should say is there are some brilliant young actors in Manchester. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But I, it was very personal. It was about yourself. And really, we're putting at the end of this program mm -hmm. your biography because mm -hmm. it's your latest work. Mm -hmm. Your mother was Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. She had to go back to Ethiopia, That's or right. Abyssinia, as it was then called. Right. And you're left there. Can I say I thought it, was, it wasn't very tough, but a bit tough on the white foster parents? Who didn't know, who can't have really understood what they were doing. Okay. Go on. Okay. These foster parents in this specific play did not want to actually blame themselves or question themselves um, in that situation, so they put it on the child. So, and the child in that play went away thinking that it was his or his fault. Yeah. This is when he's 12 and they say yeah, you need to go into exactly, a home. Yeah. So he had to relearn after his social worker was saying, you know, this isn't how it is, Lem. You know, he was, I mean, it's awkward, isn't it, talking about the play, and it's also about me. Um, so it's not harsh at all on those specific foster parents. Maybe on other ones who, who, who uh, uh, are already foster black children. But I personally believe that black children should be fostered to black families because it can save a lot of trauma for the black child. And I'm not really concerning myself with the, with the needs of um, even liberal uh, even left-wing foster parents who, who want to do the best. And I can understand that a lot of them do, but it's not relevant. At this time, at this time, it's not All right, at this time. There was one moment in there which I thought, a literary moment, because you were on the stage, people were play the young kids were playing out the parts, mm -hmm. and there's a bit where the parents say, you've got to go into a home, will you go? And you from the back of the stage, what was the line? He said yes. Because he loved them so exactly, much. Exactly, yeah. I no. mean, that's the big... Yeah, yeah. I just thought that was a very emotional moment. And yeah. I, I... Is that... I mean, there was a lot of pain in that, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a lot of pain. Because, um, because he never knew about children's homes until they said, you do know about children's homes, yeah? So he thought, as children do when they're children, that he should agree with his parents. I mean, he literally thought that he was going away for two weeks on holiday, or, you know, he didn't, um, so that, it was a very emotional, sort of, like, decision, and then to have to backtrack on all that, you know. And how does it feel experience. now to be a writer, yeah. to be a writer, <laughs> right? It feels, yeah, it's better than cleaning gutters. <laughs> true, to true. To be a writer who, nevertheless, like all writers, I think, what did Yates say about lying down in the rag and bone shop of the heart? Mm. Mm. You've got to pillage and steal from the pain of your youth mm. to produce stuff to sell in bookshops. How does yeah. that feel? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't actually believe that um, I've pillaged my youth, but I, I do believe that I've got to learn a lot as a writer, which means that I will be able to write about things not so um, personal and be able to do it well, and etc. I think I had direct inspiration to write that play. Um, so I used it, but I think it's now been used. So as a developing writer, I have to find other things to write about. But it's still going to be founded in experience, I would imagine. Yes, yeah. I mean, I think all writing is about fi founding on experience, all writing. If you write a character in a play, you're writing a teeny bit about yourself. It can be a lot or it can be a teeny bit, do you know what I mean? And stretched. And this is, I'm a developing writer and this is my future. That is your future and your present. Tender fingers in a clenched fist, the volume out now. Thank you very much, Lam. It's a Thanks. real pleasure talking to you. Thanks. Next Thursday's celebration at 10.35 comes face-to-face -face with Manchester playwright Trevor Griffiths.